Well, good morning, ACF. How's everybody doing this morning? Amen. I hope I don't disappoint from that introduction. Uh, when Chris said, look under your seat for the seat belts, me and my daughter was looking for like an Oprah-type prize. We were like, oh, they started giving our prizes <laughs> at church. I thought I was going to win a car, but you just get me. Amen. <laughs> the kingdom of God goes against your natural inclinations. It stands against culture. It can leave us feeling foolish and it's costly to enter. The cost is everything. We're gonna dive into the scripture today. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand. We have a wonderful group of Bible people in the aisles that will bring you a copy of scripture that is yours to keep, uh, give away. If you're cheap and give away uh, presents, you can give that away to somebody who needs one. I know for a fact that there is a love of giving away the scripture here at Austin Christian Fellowship. Austin Christian Fellowship. So I was called by Will and asked to share uh, this morning about the law of grace. The law of grace. And this series has been phenomenal. I've been, I'm glad that they do capture the sermons. I've been able to go online and listen and watch and get acclimated to what is being said in this house. And let me tell you, there is a certain amount of dedication and devotion to the word that is not everywhere in the body of Christ. And I know for a fact that ACF desires for you to be disciples of Christ who know, love, and serve Jesus Christ. The reason I know is because when I was going and planning out in Pflugerville, I asked Will, can I steal that? He said it was inspired by the Holy Ghost. I said, okay, I'll take it. And that's our mission values as well, is to uh, create disciples who know, love, and serve Jesus Christ. So if you have a Bible, meet me in Matthew Chapter 19 and verse 30. Meet me in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 30. And before we do that, I want you to use your sanctified imaginations and try to remember the toughest work day in your life. The toughest work day in your life. Well, you felt at lunchtime that you could not go further, you wanted to give up, you wanted to give out, you were like, this is just too much for anybody. Now to add to that, imagine that at your job there was no roof and the hot Texas heat was bearing down upon you just to add to that challenge. And then think about you weren't salaried or you weren't paid weekly or bi-weekly or monthly, but you had to work each day for your daily bread. And this is where we are dropped smack dab in the middle of an answer that Jesus has given to one of the apostles, Peter, about the kingdom of heaven. And just for a little bit more context, he's actually answering Peter's question because they had just encountered a rich young ruler who had all of his needs uh, uh, supplied. He had all of his needs met. And Jesus said uh, to him to just leave everything and follow him because he wanted to know how to obtain eternal life. And Jesus told him to, uh, to uh, simply obey the commandments. And he said, oh, got that check, did that, been there. I do it all the time. You said, okay, well, since you've done that, leave everything that you have and follow me. Because Jesus was checking his heart posture. The rich young rulers couldn't do it, and so he went away sad. And so then the apostles sat around and said, uh, 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 well, Jesus said to the apostles, it is harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. The apostles were astonished. Because Jesus always said weird stuff like that. They were like, okay, so, so what does that mean? Who can be saved? And he said, well, it's impossible for man, but anything is possible 
for God. And Peter, as Will said a couple of weeks ago, Peter being the one who says what we're all thinking. Well, if he can't get saved, then obviously the blessings of God is upon his life. He has these things in abundance. What about us who's given up everything for your kingdom's sake? And Jesus told him, yeah, you guys, you're going to rule over the tribes of Israel in heaven and everybody who's given up house or family or wealth or field will be repaid a hundredfold in heaven. We paid a hundredfold in heaven. So we see that the kingdom is costly. But then Jesus, he goes on to say this in Matthew 19 and verse 30. <laughs> but many who are first will be last and the last first. What does this mean? I'm glad you asked. That's what the context we're going into. The next verse in Matthew uh, 21 through 16, we're going to read this. It should be up on the screen. And it reads, about nine in the morning. I'm sorry, that's not what it is. I'm, I'm getting used to y'all's confidence moth here. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day, and he sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the... I can't read. I'm sorry. Let me get to my Bible. This is the reason you bring your Bibles, Chris. Yes, sir. Technology. Can anybody help the pastor find out where Matthew is? <laughs> Commercial break. Back to Matthew 20, verse 2. He says, After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into the vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went, going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour. He said the same and did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? Isn't it like Jesus to ask the obvious question? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I chose to give you this last, I chose to give this last worker as I give to you. I'm not allowed to, am I not, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first will be last. As a thesis statement for this morning, grace is never fair. Grace is never fair. This is why the person who wrote Amazing Grace coined that term because it's so amazing, it's mind-boggling. The math is mind-bending. 
You can never calculate grace. You can never write an algorithm to show you how someone deserves grace. It's God's unmerited, unwarranted favor on our lives. It's God's way of loving the unlovable. God's way of making righteous in his sight those who don't deserve anything but death. And so grace is never fair. And here's another thing. God does not treat us all the same, nor does he show us all the same amount of generosity. In the words of Dr. Crawford Luritz, he says, the way to inject embalming fluid in your spiritual life is to compare yourself to others. The way to inject embalming fluid into your life, your spiritual life, is to, is to compare yourself to others. And sometimes we know this cognitively, but when we're in the kingdom and we're walking with God, we so easily forget this fact. That I came in the world with nothing. And I'll leave this world with nothing. And everything in between is a mercy of God. And so we see these workers here having a hard day and this is like us in the kingdom of God. Now briefly, I'm going to uh, present the characters of this parable into the real life of believers. And then we're going to talk about primarily the master of the house and the laborers. If you're under the sound of my voice right now, online or here in the room, and you are a believer and you have been uh, uh, baptized into the body of Christ, you are a laborer whether you like it or not. You are a laborer whether you like it or not. You are called to a ministry of reconciliation to work alongside God to do what God is doing here on earth whether you like it or not. There's nobody who gets time off for disability. There's no corner office suite where you can just uh, direct other people to work. No, you are a worker in the vineyard. You are a day laborer. That's why we pray, give us today our daily bread. Give us what we need today to sustain us so that we might be able to do your bidding and do your will today. Y'all are real quiet today, so either I'm preaching real good or it's a dud. I don't know which one. So briefly, the vineyard is humanity. The vineyard is the world. Jesus often taught about this. This is not the only illustration that Jesus gives about the harvest. Jesus actually told his disciples to pay, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the harvest because the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We also see when Jesus met with the woman at the well and the disciples went off to get him something to eat and he came, they came back and he said, my, will, my, my food is to do the will of the Father. Look up for the harvest is white. It's about souls. It's about people who are far away from God, us being close to God, ushering them into a relationship with God. And listen, the work gets hard because we make it hard. The work gets tough because we make it tough. And so let's look back at the parable, at the people who arrive early in the morning. Let's use our sanctified imaginations real quick. Imagine you're in the marketplace and you show up with your tool belt and your stuff for a day's work. Now, in ancient Near Eastern culture, they understood that a day's work would be 12 hours, six to six. 
And day laborers were even lower than slaves because slaves were attached to the master's well-being. The master had to take care of his slaves, but the day worker worked for his daily bread. He didn't have a bank account. He didn't have ability to stop, store up, and have land. He was a person who worked day to day. Day to day. And so you show up and you're ready. And all the vineyard owners are coming because the harvest is coming and, 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 and they're picking laborers based upon the way that they look or how, how, how enthusiastic they are in the morning. Let me make it real for you because I've done this before. Me and Linda were talking just this morning about years ago. Um, I was in Linda's uh, small group and we were sharing stories where me and my wife had this brilliant idea that we were going to buy 16 acres of land way outside of the city. And I was going to build our home, our permanent home, not a, a place to go hunting or a place to go fishing. This is where we were going to live. I was going to build it out in the country. Now, this is a really long time ago. I did not have YouTube like you guys have YouTube today. You can Google or go into YouTube nowadays and say, how do you build a homestead? And you get 50,000 videos of how to do this. This is back in the day. I had a book that I went to an actual bookstore, and I'm reading about plumbing and decking and all this kind of stuff because I was bad enough to build a house. Well, halfway through the process, I realized that I was in over my head. As a matter of fact, have you ever seen that old money, uh, movie, The Money Pit? That was my life. I was hemorrhaging money. I had got robbed a couple of times. I had a general contractor who went to church with me, who robbed me. And I'm like, okay, this is really a good uh, 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 opportunity for me to be loving God. And I would invite people from the church to help. I didn't know how to lay floors, and, and, and they weren't professionals. And so I look at my floor and go, yeah, that's not the way I wanted it to turn out. <laughs> so someone told me that there were day laborers who met Again, I'm outside the city. It was another small town I had a park where they all would go and meet. Now, I was working a full-time job. I was youth pastoring and building a house. So I was tired. And so I would work on the house to 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, get a few hours of sleep, and then uh, go to work. And on this particular Saturday, I said, I'm going to wake up early, and I'm going to go and get the best day laborers, and they're going to help me out. I'm going to pay them top dollar, and we're going to show up. I overslept. I got there about noon. And you don't know what type of, you don't want to know what type of work is left at noon. I saw a guy uh, across there, he was talking to all these guys. I'm like, oh man, I don't have a whole lot to pick from. And so I said, hey buddy, come here. And I said, you speak English? He said, yeah, I speak English. I said, hey man, get a few of your friends, come to my house and we're gonna build some stuff. He said, okay, yeah. And so he gets them all there, I'll jump in the back of my truck and we go. I get back to the land, and again, this marketplace where they, where they gathered was about 30, 40 minutes from my house. I was way out in the sticks. And so they all get out the truck, and I tell the, the guy that spoke English, he rode up front with me, and I say, hey, get out and tell them that we're going to do this, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do this. He said, uh, huh? I said, tell them, tell them in Spanish that we're going to do this, this, and this. He said, uh, I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> no sabe? <laughs> you were just having a whole conversation with them at the park. Oh, we were just joking around and, you know, as best we could, but I don't speak Spanish. He says, I'm a Syrian. I grew up in Chicago. <laughs> now it's 45 minutes back to the, and there's nobody going to be left at this point. And so I did the best that I could. I said, okay, you, drywall. You know, I'm doing all this kind of stuff. I took Spanish in high school, but it was long gone. Needless to say, the people who came at the 12th hour probably weren't the best workers by the world standard. They probably wasn't the ones that were there early in the morning that were, that were, that were hey, man, pick me, pick me, pick me. I got tools. I've done this. I have experience. I know what I'm doing. And so we see this dichotomy of these workers that are showing up hour after hour. But here's the thing that I want to point out, that the landowner would have known that the people who were there at the end of the day weren't as good as the people who were there at the beginning of the day. But he still chose to pay them the same. And so let's talk about the hearts of the people who were there first. 
Because again, he's answering this question that Peter had asked directly, and he's shooting shots across Peter's bow. Because Peter said, what about us who's given up everything? It's cost us everything to be a part of this kingdom. The people who were there first, what did they say? They said, we've been here all day long, and we bear the burden of all the work, and it's hot. Any believers in the room that you just feel like you're getting weary and well-doing? I feel like I'm talking to some believers today that you're going and you feel like you can't go another further because the challenges of life and the challenges of working in the Lord's vineyard is beating you down. And what happens when we get to that place? We begin to compare ourselves to people who aren't doing as much as we're doing. We're forgetting to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. He says, we bear the burden of the day. It's hot out here. And then he says this, and this is a telling statement. If you take nothing else from this message today, take this. He said, you've made them equal to us. Wow. Did you forget that you were a day laborer? This is what the Lord said. Did you not forget that whatever you have is because of my generosity? You see, sometimes when we're gifted and we're talented, we get too big for our britches. That's what my grandma used to say. She would tell me, sit down somewhere. For you English majors, that is sit down somewhere. And this is what happens often when we enter the kingdom because we have stuff to offer, we have stuff that's good, and we begin to look at other churches who aren't as good as our church. Other pastors don't preach as good as our pastor. Other children's church ministries aren't good as our children's church ministry. Well, the second side of it, the other side of that is, and I've seen this, uh, it's been 10 years since we planted. Um, It's so funny, when I saw Will, I was at the uh, 30-year anniversary, Will just looked at me, my hair is cut short today, he said, dang, you're gray. Because in 2020, I saw people, we know what happened in 2020, right? I saw the church lose its mind. Somebody said that's right. The church lost its mind. People started infighting and biting. And you're not equal to me because you don't believe like me. Because you don't vote like me. And Jesus would vote donkey or Jesus would vote elephant. Jesus wrote neither one. He's in heaven. You don't look at the world the proper way. You're not equal to me. This is what is happening in this parable. All the school I've been through, all the Bible studies I've been to, I know some things about God, and you're not on my level. And we're forgetting that Jesus said to pray to the Lord of the harvest for workers in the harvest because you're getting worn out, you're getting tired. And before you know it, you're ready to walk away from God. I've not seen in my entire 50 years on this planet so many people who are deconstructing their faith like they are right now. Because we've gotten to a place where we've forgotten who the Lord or the master of the house is. For the next few moments, I just want to talk about the master of the house. Hmm. In the old Baptist church, they used to say, God is good. And if you know anything, the response is all the time. And all the time, God is good. There's never a point in the master's mastery (laughs) that he's not good. I believe that we're the only religion, I think we're the only religion, 
where God can hold two truths in tension that seem to object to one another. He can already be gracious over here and give justice. He can love and hate sin. God is always good. And whatever God says, whatever God determines, is always the right answer. It is. Whatever God says is always the way that it should be. But we have finite minds and we don't have the proper understanding that God has. Listen, if you had all the information that God had, you would make the same decision that God made. If you had all the information that God had, you would make the same decision that God made. Let me show you this. Let's go back and rewind and think about this scenario again in our sanctified minds. Now we're not the people who were there at first, but we're the people who were there at the end of the day who still hasn't had anything to, nobody hire us. My bills are due, and if I don't get paid today, I'm out on the street. Maybe it's a single mother who for the last three days have been feeding the kids and the kids have said, mama, eat. And she's like, no, I ate earlier, baby. And she's lying because she don't want her kids to not eat. Maybe it's the husband who, who, who has bitten his fingernails to the bone because he doesn't know how he's going to provide for his family and none of them have eaten. None of them have their daily met, needs met. Maybe medical bills are through the roof. I've been employed, unemployed for six months. I don't have skills. I'm not a worker. I don't go out into the vineyard. I don't know how to do this stuff. I don't even know how to beg because I've lived my life in luxury my entire life and I don't know how to beg. It, 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 I, I just don't. My, my pride won't let me get there. And Jesus shows up and says, why are you still here? Because <laughs> no one will hire me. I'm unhirable. I have a mental illness where I can't go to a job. They don't want me around people. I'm unhirable. I'm unlovable. He says, you go into the vineyard too. Doesn't it change the perspective? Going back to my story when I was way out in the country in the sticks, I just wanted to, after the hour, I wanted to fire every last one of them. I did. I went into another room and I looked up and there was, I was grateful for the guy who wasn't scared of heights. Because I had just looked at a news uh, story the week before that a man had a, a slanty pitch roof and he had fell off the roof and died. And I made up in my mind right then when I heard that news story, I am not getting up on that roof. One guy was like, oh, let me do it. He made this makeshift thing with this board. And he was just up there and I was like, praise God for him. But the rest of them, unhirable. They had more drywall screws in the drywall than the drywall weighed. It was just like seven. I looked up and it looked like it, it, it was just like watermelon seeds all up the house. I was like, what are we doing here? And brother said, it's strong, brother. It stay. No, duh. <laughs> Nothing was going right. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to just take them back. And, and I felt like the Lord was telling me, nope. They need this. They need this more than you need your next draw from the bank. So keep them. I said, okay. And at the end of the day, they say, hey, brother, we come back and work tomorrow. I said, nope, got church. <laughs> Thank God for Sunday. <laughs> but oftentimes, we look down upon others that are not equal to us because we don't know their story. We don't know why that person abuses alcohol. We don't know why that person does drugs. 
We don't know why that person has the political affiliation that they have, but they are the other because they think differently than us. And God, you can't make them equal to us because they can't be Christians and think like that. Anybody change their mind in the middle of their walk? What about you read the Bible, you've read some, you were like, you know what, I used to believe like this, but golly, it's hard for me to believe like that anymore. The older saints in the room going, mm-hmm. Because when we're young, like Peter was probably young. When we're young, we have this, this youthful exuberance, and we know everything. And the older we get, we begin to resolve, I know a lot, but I don't know nothing. And this is what Jesus is talking to Peter about. He said, the kingdom of heaven is a long slog. Some will come early and some will come later. But guess what? They both get the same pay. They both get what I give to them. And so what is Jesus ultimately trying to teach us in this? I got a few application points and then I'll let you go home. I want to preach a little longer so the people at my church who visited and say, we know you can go shorter, Pastor. <laughs> nope, y'all are still stuck with my long-windedness. I'm going to follow protocol here, though. Takeaways. If you take notes, these are the takeaways. When you're in the kingdom of God, it's extremely dangerous to think what's in it for me. You know, they even teach us uh, as you lead churches when you do announcements. The way that you do announcements and the way that you do this, you have to have a call to action that resonates with people. A dangerous thing in the kingdom of God is what's in it for me. We're trying to motivate people to serve in certain capacities in the kingdom and you'll never know the joy and the love of working in his vineyard if you're doing it by saying, what's in it for me? I want to bless the people back in Camp Fun right now because my grandbabies are back there and I know you're making your, 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 your crowns in heaven right now. You, you're getting your jewels and your crown right now with my grandbabies. Amen. On the front row right here, we have one of our elders who used to be my son, who's also on the front rows, children's church pastor, who poured into him, and he just loves his Uncle Stan now. They're not even related, but he loves his Uncle Stan. He calls him Uncle Stan. My daughter, we were driving down the street not too long ago, and uh, I told Stan this. She was driving. She said, man, I just love that man. I hope he just lives forever. Because he took time to pour into these children years ago and now they're excellent parents and he's created a generation of, 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 of workers in the vineyard because he was just faithful and he never asked for anything. And so I give him his roses now. And there's some of you sitting in the seats right now, you're like, I'm just too busy to do these things and I'm, I'm, I'm just too busy to volunteer and I'm just too busy to get involved in my neighborhood and I'm just too busy to do these things. Listen, listen, God is tugging on your heart right now to ask you or to tell you to get in the game. I don't use the word ask and if y'all do it here, I apologize, but I don't use the word ask. Jesus doesn't ask, Jesus gives commandments. Yeah. He told the disciples, if you love me, you say you love me, do what I say do. And so you're a laborer in the vineyard, you don't have a choice. Now the thing is, we need to raise our hand and say, here I am, Lord, send me. Send me. So don't ask what's in it for me. Secondarily, I said it earlier, comparison is really dangerous and it has no place in the body of Christ. Well, I can't pray like Chris or I can't preach like Will. And all I can do is work in a nursery. Thank you! And all the moms and dads who get to listen to a sermon for 35 minutes say, thank you! 
And in the kingdom, the first will be last and the last will be first. Listen, I know I preach my heart at every week and I might be sitting at the back of the line going, who's that sister right there that ain't nobody ever met? Up at the front of the line. What did she do? Well, she was an intercessor. Because prayer is a primary work. She stayed up all night long praying for the work of the church. Prayer precedes the preaching. Yes, it does. Prayer precedes the mission trip. As Watchman Nee says, if the power of God is a locomotive, then prayer is the tracks. That's a lot of work to do. Jesus said it. The harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. So what do we do? We have to, imp- we have, we have to. Say we have to. We have to. Focus on the importance of God's grace. We have to focus on the importance of God's grace. Because when, be, when we become gracious, my name Sean means God is gracious, by the way, so I need a lot of grace. When we come, begin to look at people through the lens that God looks at them. I just say all the time, it ain't none of my business. That's between them and God. The Bible says if you see someone sinning and it's not unto death, pray. I learned to mind my business. A friend of mine sent me a meme the other day. There was a guy walking down the street, and maybe some of you have seen it. He's by this fence, and these people on the other side of the fence are yelling, 13, 13, 13. And he tries to go over the fence. It's too tall to go over. He tries to look under, but he can't look under the fence. And he finally finds a notch in the fence, and he looks through, and someone's finger comes out and goes, boop, and they go, 14, 14, 14. That's all I need to learn to mind my business. And so what does this scripture tell us? We found out what it told us about ourselves. What does it say about the master? In verse 13, we learn that God is trustworthy. And I love the way that he said friend. I've done you no wrong, friend. Did I not give you what I agreed to give you? You can trust him. If I'm not mistaken, that's the, what the no and no love serve means, right? Learning to trust God. We're on a journey learning to trust God. Yeah, he's trustworthy. If God tells you it, you can take that to the bank. Yeah. If God says, look under your seat, like Chris said earlier, there will be a three-legged lizard with purple eyes. You better look up under your seat. Because God is trustworthy. If he said it, he will bring it to fruition. Secondarily, he's good. All the time. Verses 14 and 15, he said, Did I, uh, uh, listen, 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 listen. Is it not my right to do what I want to do with my stuff? He's sovereign. He's not omnipotent. There's a lot of theological truths here in this text. I can do what I want to do with why I want to do it. And we have a hard time because we start, well, I don't like the way you're doing it, God. How are you going to elevate that person in ministry and they, <laughs> they did me wrong 17 years ago? You still hold on to that? Rewind the tape. We got to be forgiving. They made a fool out of me. That's what the kingdom will do. He's generous and grateful. And he's not a respecter of person. I don't know who this is for this morning, but I, I, I just have to say this before I sit down. Some of us are in a place in our walk where we have to outlive the lie. Some of us are in a place in our walk where we need to outlive the lies. You've been told you're not good enough. 
You've been told you don't measure up. And it wasn't just the devil, it was actual people who told you this. You're just like your mother, you'll never change. You're just like your father, you'll never be significant in this world. We have to stop believing the lies and keep on living and allowing God and his grace and his mercy to transform our minds. Because there's no sin too big that I can think of in the scripture that is too big for Jesus to lift on the cross. And so that's why the people in the last hour who don't measure up, who are not good enough in the world's mind, who don't look like the rich young ruler who had it all together, or so he thought. I've obeyed all the commandments. What are you talking about? I'm Holy Ghost Junior. <laughs> we're frail and we're fractured and we're broken. But that doesn't give us a work exemption from being involved in his kingdom. As a matter of fact, he said he'll take the foolishness of this world to confound the wise. I believe God would take someone who's fractured and marred and who doesn't have it all together and use them more powerfully than the person who thinks they have it all together. I look no further than my family tree. Murderers, pimps, drug dealers. You can only imagine with the family tree like that how I grew up. And the things I've endured. But oh, to understand the grace of God and the law of grace. And he speaks loudly and clearly to me all the time. Sean, my grace is sufficient for you. I know you don't think you can do it, but stand there. My grace is sufficient. Will you join me in outliving the lie? Can we pray? So for the next few moments, let me, let me ask you to do this. Just where you are. Pray that God would. Reveal his grace to you. Just right where you are for the next few moments. And I'll consolidate us in prayer. When you hear my voice, I'll consolidate us in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this hour. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your command to go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Hmm. Lord, teach us to continuously pray to you that you will send more laborers into the harvest. Father, let us not look at the hour that they come let us not compare ourselves. Let us not think that we're not worthy, Lord God. If you called us to it, you will bring us through it, O oh God. Through the scorching heat of the day. Through the burdens that come along with this life. You're equal to it and even greater than it, Lord, if we just cast our hope upon you. Father, be with this church. Lord, I know that life-changing ministry happens here. It happened for me, Lord God. Let no one despise who they've been, Lord God, but let them see themselves through the grace, the mercy, and the love that you see in them.
Father, we love you. We give you glory. Change this neighborhood and this city through this church and the workers who come out of this church. It's in Jesus' matchless name that we pray. Amen. Thank you.